Okay, so anybody who knows me of the five people who watch this channel um, knows that the filmmaker that I'm near religious in my fervor about talking about is George Miller. That's just, you know, a truism. But his style did not arrive in a vacuum, and for those who are uninitiated, uh, I'm going to talk about where his particular style of filmmaking came from, and uh, some of the people who riffed off his own style, some, uh, some of the ones who inspired his style, and about the general, messy, amazing, wonderful craziness of the genre that is exploitation. So, so what I've done right now is, to my right, below the frame, is I've compiled uh, some of my personal favorite uh, Ausploitation releases. And I'm going to go and give you a general history of what Ausploitation is first. Now, Ausploitation, uh, to explain it, we had to kind of go back a little bit. In the 1970s, well, the 1960s, really, uh, the Australian film industry didn't really exist as we know it right now. It was kind of a small cottage industry because of things that had happened uh, as a result of the Second World War. They weren't really making films. Um, after a certain point, there was kind of a dead space. Now, what happened, though, because of various governmental tax breaks and uh, the, the state funding of the arts industry, um, suddenly, in the late 60s, almost overnight, uh, a, well, a, a film industry began to, you know, kind of spring to life. Uh, mostly made up of, like, you know, former uh, television workers and things like that. Now, it did, it, it did retain its cottage industry quality. Um, it was very small, and most of the people who worked on these films, uh, worked for very, very cheap, uh, they worked on each other's films, you know, it, it, it really was, in general, a model of what I think the film industry in general should be like. Um, now, the interesting part about this, though, is that, uh, in about 1969, um, the, the path of the Australian film industry kind of diverged. Uh, into two clearly delineated uh, paths. On one hand, you had the state-funded uh, films, you know, ones that were, you know, uh, said to have more clear artistic merit, uh, historical dramas, things that were really about Australia's history, you know, uh, things like Breaker Morant, uh, Peter Weir, uh, with Picnic of Hanging Rock, you know, things like that, uh, and even The Last Wave afterwards, all that's kind of more of a, more of a stranger film, I think. Um, those were the more respectable pictures, and I think they put a lot of emphasis on those because they would have made for a clearer export to the rest of the world that Australia did have its own uh, artistic identity in terms of filmmaking. But at the same time, as happens in most places, uh, on the other end of it, was a whole a whole slew of some of the most pure genre exercises, some of the raunchiest, most violent, strange uh, films you've ever seen. Uh, and these we call exploitation. Um, it started off with kind of like sex comedies, like I mean, like the like the Adventures of Barry McKenzie in the late in the late sixties. Uh, also, also I believe featuring George Spence, who we'll come to later on, uh, and then very quickly uh, we got into action filmmaking, horror films, suspense thrillers, things like that, um, which of course led to George Miller, and then a lot of the other filmmakers we're going to be talking about here as well. Um, so let's kind of go into it um, now. One thing that must be made clear, though, in any kind of consideration of exploitation as a genre, is that, of course, this is a label that was, you know, kind of foisted upon these films after the fact by, uh, the, U by the U.S. distributors who were uh, responsible for, you know, getting the films out there, uh, or, and also, I guess, like the U.K. distributors as well. Uh, this, this became their identity, you know. Uh, these films themselves, within, uh, you know, taken out of their vacuum, or 
inside the vacuum of just Australian cinema in general, uh, they're, they're not consciously riffing on Australian culture. As a matter of fact, they're not, a lot of them aren't really riffing on Australian culture at all. They're well-told crime dramas, they're well-told horror films, or, you know, in some cases, not so well-told. Um, but all the same, these films are, even though that's a somewhat artificial definition of them to call them exploitation, uh, they do demonstrate much more of the ribald and much more of the, uh, what I guess they call the awkward quality of Australian culture. I know it's a little bit weird for me to be fascinated with Australian culture, but, you know, there are other reasons for that that I'll get into later on. Um, a lot of what you'll see in here, I guess, is... Well, one thing that people said about about exploitation cinema when it came out, at least those who were in uh, Australia at the time watching these films as they arrived, is that they, you know in their way, because maybe it's because they were genre pictures, they demonstrated a clearer image of Australian culture than the prettier, more consciously highbrow films, like Picking a Hanging Rock, or, you know, Break a Morant, or, or even Gallipoli later on. Um, which, there's a particular example that I'll get on to later on, as far as that goes. So, let's dive in. So, so the first film that I want to talk about is not specifically an exploitation film, but you can definitely see it as a progenitor of a lot of the techniques and a lot of the uh, specific tone, particular tone, that you can find in exploitation cinema. And of course that film is uh, Ted Kuchif's fantastic masterpiece, uh, Wake and Fright. We have here, this is actually an Australian imprint, and a funny story, when I was looking for this film, I found this... Uh, completely out of nowhere, after searching for it for months. Uh, tucked away in a shelf at a Best Buy. They didn't even have it in their inventory system. I just kind of pulled out. They were like, we didn't, we didn't know that was there. Anyway, Wake and Fright is uh, one of those kind of like hallucinogenic, nightmarish films that, you know, uh, I mean, really, honestly, looking back at it, I can't think of anything like it, really. It's, it's, it's visceral. Uh, Maybe After Hours would be a good comparison, but, I mean, the time frame is different, the, you know, con you know. so it's, it's about this rather cosmopolitan teacher from the city who gets a job uh, teaching, but he gets waylaid in this small town in the outback, Yaba, you know, and uh, he gets stuck there, and he gets stuck inside this uh, culture of drinking and excess and, you know, misogyny and machismo and all sorts of stuff, and he becomes lost in it, you know, uh, the atmosphere and the tone of this film and the style of it, the pure style, is just, it's so amazing. It's, you know, and even though it's not a, it's not a Western on wheels or a post-apocalyptic film, as we'll get to later on, uh, this definitely is a film where the phrase figures in a landscape is, def is important in the, the visual language of it. Um, this, this film has a lot to say about masculinity. Uh, it has a lot to say about the, uh, the, I guess what the filmmaker viewed as, uh, the toxic alcoholic culture of the outback. Uh, now it should be said that the director himself was not Australian. He came to Australia to make this film. And that's one of those anecdotes I was referring to, you know, when this film was first screened back in the seventies. Uh, it, it, it engendered a lot of uh, controversy from uh, Australians who, you know, didn't like seeing that part of themselves on screen. And in fact, one of the first screenings, there was somebody who stood up and said, that's not us. What are you talking about? That's not us. And someone stood up from the back and they were like, that, yeah, 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 it is. So this is one of my favorite films. It's visceral. It's terrifying. It's really uncomfortable in the best way. It just, it moves like, uh, it moves like lightning, even now, you know. And seeing this get, you know, restored after hearing about it for so long, after getting into Australian cinema, and finally being able to, like, actually see it. You know, I, I saw it on the big screen when it came through, uh, through Draft House, who released it, which I'll get into in a second, uh, was amazing. Speaking of Draft House, oh, gravity. 
Uh, speaking of Draft House, they also released it. And this I have on DVD just because I have the Blu-ray. It's the same restoration. Uh, Eureka also released this, I believe, in their Masters of Cinema line overseas. Uh, this is actually, a, I believe, uh, some of the extras, some of the same extras are ported over from the release that I just pointed out and the Eureka release as well. Um, it's rather stacked. Uh, and there's their releases, our own, <laughs> it makes me kind of proud, our own local releases are so stacked and they're so well put together that it's just, it's, it's really astounding. Um, this, I believe, is exclusively Region A. Uh, the other one that I, which is actually from Australia, is Region A, B, and C. So they're both available depending on what your taste is. The Eureka release is only Region B. But either way, this is the cheaper version that you can pick up, I believe. It's the one that's most readily available because they were the U.S. distributors of the film when it was re-released. Uh, however you can pick this up, pick it up. It's fantastic. It's it's genuinely amazing. It's one of Martin Scorsese's films, as you can see his little quote there that they threw on top. Uh, see it as quick as you can. Um, the next two we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about as a pair, uh, because they're from one specific filmmaker, and that guy's name is Brian Trenchard-Smith. Now, he is basically in the 70s, the 60s, and the 80s, and I guess even into the 90s, he was the Australian cinema's equivalent to Roger Corman. He was the B-movie auteur, you know? When you hear the guy talk, what's really interesting about him is he's kind of a study in contrast, because he, here's a guy who worships at the altar of cinema. You know, he knows all the tricks. He knows uh, he's so well-read and versed on, you know, the history of the form, its development. He has a great love for... Uh, for, you know, introspective, innovative, uh, you know, cinema. Uh, and also a lot of it comes from his having worked on a lot of these films as well, or worked around these films, or been in the industry when they were coming up. To hear him talk is to hear a man uh, who genuinely loves everything about the medium that he's working in. Now, what's funny about that is that his films, however, are some of the raunchiest, some of the silliest, and some of the just most bald-faced, like, exploitation films you'll ever see in your life, right? Now, we're not quite going chronologically in this video here, uh, but first up, from Umbrella Entertainment, which is Australia's own homegrown uh, distribution label, we have one of his most famous films, The Man from Hong Kong. This is actually not open, but I have seen the film uh, a few times. It's really, really funny. It's kind of a takeoff on James Bond uh, with an you know, with a Chinese man in the in the lead, I guess hopscotching off the time, the particular popularity of Bruce Lee going around, making the rounds. Um, now, this edition is really, really stocked. Uh, we've got audio commentaries, we've got uncut interviews from Not Quite Hollywood, that fantastic documentary from Mark Hartley that came out a few years ago. Uh, making of trailers from hell with Brian Trenchard Smith, which are always so much funny. Like I say, so much fun to listen to and talk and uh, hear. But what's also interesting is that this uh, edition uh, actually has huh, one, two, three, four, five, five other Brian Trenchard Smith exploitation films um, featuring commentary and things like that. So this is an amazing edition already. Uh, we've got Stunt Rock which uh, you'll also hear about in Not Quite a Hollywood featuring one of my, fa my, like my favorite quotes in the entire world when it comes to making a film. You know, we figured much stunt, much rock, put them together, the kids will love it. You know, uh, The film itself is so much fun. It's full of just amazing stunts. You've got Grant Page in there, who's one of, like, one of uh, Australian cinema's stunt icons. He, like The guy does everything. He's, he's, he's insane in the best way, and he's still alive, still talking about stuff, I believe. Um, George Lazenby plays the villain in a in a peculiar uh, surprise, which is <laughs> really interesting because you know he didn't really do much after Honor, Majesty's Secret Service. And then we also have Hugh Keysburn, who of course we all know from Mad Max and Mad Max Fury Road. Um, and then of course we actually get a cameo from Sammo Hung, famous Chinese uh, action cinema director Sammo Hung. Uh, there's a lot of raucous humor. In here it's great stuff uh, it's real raunchy uh, the film gets a big kick out of uh, making the main character be as badass a motherfucker as you've ever seen you know uh, but it also too uh, 
takes a lot of pleasure in uncomfortable racial humor, which is one of Brian Trinchard Smith's, uh, well, not really him specifically, but it's just, you know, this is kind of one of the things. Um, it's nothing in bad taste. It's, it's great stuff. Pick this up if you can. It's not too expensive on Amazon. Fantastic stuff. Now, the other one that I want to talk about from him is, this one came later on in the 80s. Um, this is sort of Brian Trinchard Smith's uh, takeoff on Mad Max. This is Dead End Drive-In, right? The post-apocalyptic, uh, and this release is from Arrow Video, the post-apocalyptic, uh, kind of a blend of, or a more conscious blend, I guess, of A Clockwork Orange and Mad Max. Um, and I guess also to the Cars 8 Paris, which they mentioned on the back of here as a reference point, uh, this edition is also rather stocked in the Arrow style. Of course, there's uh, commentaries. Uh, you've got Brian Trinchard Smith's kind of breakthrough documentary about the stuntmen featuring Grant Page, of course. Uh, this is a lot of fun. It has brilliant atmosphere, brilliant cinematography. Some of the, uh, outside of the Mad Max series, probably some of the best car stunt work that you'll see, although that kind of comes later on. Uh, it has... It has such a, such a, such, such, there's like a pungent texture, I guess, would be a good way to put it, in terms of the post-apocalyptic society that they're depicting here, you know. Uh, it's, it's goofy, it's over the top, as it's supposed to be, uh, but the last, the last scene of the film is like one of my favorites when it comes to like car action set pieces in general. Um, and once again... This is Brian Trinchard Smith not taking himself super seriously as a filmmaker. He takes film very seriously. He doesn't take himself very seriously as a filmmaker, and that's demonstrated very clearly here. Uh, he knows this is a very high concept uh, film, and he works it. He works it to the bone. You know, uh, it's very much like a youth in rebellion film, uh, and it's. I'm not going to say it's uh, completely surface, but. Uh, Brian Trinchard Smith is a filmmaker who deals in surfaces, at the very least, um, and he does it really well. So definitely check that out, especially if you're interested in uh, the lineage of the Mad Max films. You could definitely see this as kind of like a spiritual brother to the first two, you know, or uh, really the first one, I guess. This could be a good little uh, snapshot of what else is happening in that society, and it's, you know, not involving the police. Because that's those two. Um, also by Byron Chinchard Smith, we have, this here is just kind of a standard, I believe it was probably made to order, DVD of BMX Bandits, which was, <laughs> it was kind of meant to be kind of like a takeoff on like the, you know, the kids movies that were, you know, kind of popular in the 80s, you know, kids running around on their bikes. And it's, it's very, it's very much a gimmick film, but what's notable about it is that it's like the first film of Nicole Kidman, uh, or the first Real film by Nicole Kidman. I guess she also came to fame later on with uh, Dead Calm afterwards, I think. I, th I think. Um, I'm not really up on her filmography. Um, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And uh, there is definitely some takeoff here. Uh, the Mad Max style, low angles, visceral, uh, on the ground as they're riding their bikes and doing tricks on them. You know, BMX all-terrain bikes and so on. Uh, so, that's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm not sure if there is another release of this. There might be. Uh, I was never really inspired to go look it up. So now, I want to talk about one particular film in general. The film by Richard Franklin that uh, just got released by Shout Factory. I believe it also got remade as well. I haven't seen the remake, but I have seen this quite a few times. His takeoff on Hitchcock. The classic. The fantastic. Everybody should see it. Road Games. Road Games is amazing. You get an early Stacey Keach. You get Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, this is basically kind of like a rear window on wheels on the Australian uh, highway, you know, road trip. Uh, people move back and forth from cars, uh, from place to place. The landscape uh, rushes by, and all the while there's this uh, serial killer playing mind games with the main character. It's, you know, once again, uh, with Australian cinema, 
the atmosphere and the the location seem tailor made for it. Rather, the location seems tailor made for the atmosphere of isolation. That is such a you know a big facet and a feature of these films. Now that comes in handy uh, in more abstract and more character driven works, like say Walkabout by Nicholas Rowe, which is another one of my favorite films. But it also comes in handy too when you're making a thriller, and this is the best example of that. Now, if we take a look here, just briefly at these two editions. Now, of course, we have one from Umbrella Entertainment, which is Australia's own imprint, as I've mentioned before. Uh, this is rather stocked. We've got interviews upon interviews with uh, Stacy Keach, the director, Richard Franklin. We've got uh, commentaries, Richard Franklin. We've got, of course, we have a table read. Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry. No, no table read on this one. Uh, we've got making ofs, uncut, uh, not quite Hollywood interviews. Umbrella Entertainment was rather was rather fond of that documentary, you can tell. Uh, we've got lectures on the making of road games. Uh, this is fantastic, and like all Umbrella Entertainment releases that you can find, they're all region A, B, C, which means that uh, they're region free, basically. You know, so pick this one up if uh, I believe it's actually slightly cheaper than the Shout Factory release. This is fantastic. Uh, but Shout Factory did release their own version here with this beautiful cover art, beautiful slip cover, um, with a restoration funded by Studio Canal. Uh, this, I believe, is actually even more stock. Now, it does port over some of the same special features that the uh, Umbrella Entertainment version does, but we also get... Uh, 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 we, get audio, we get newer audio interviews with Stacey Keach. We get uh, new interviews with Grant Page, who is also, a fe uh, of course, a feature in this film. Um... We also get, I believe, I believe on this one we do get the table read. Yes, we do get the table read on this edition, which is fantastic stuff. Uh, this actually has a soundtrack composed by Brian May, who was a big, uh, who was a big feature of the uh, Australian exploitation uh, genre back then. In particular, of course, with the Mad Max films, where he uh, did the sound did the orchestral score for uh, the first two films. And I think with this one here, he fits very well in particular because his style is very influenced by, like, you know, uh, Bernard Herrmann's work on uh, on Hitchcock's, you know, films. Um, stinging, very uh, very harsh tones, you know, v visceral stuff. Thriller music, but taken up to 11, you know. I believe someone called his kind of scoring... Uh, in the Mad Max films, it was appropriate here. They called him, uh, called it Jungian music, which I think is uh, a pretty fitting description for his, and that's also true in this as well. Um, they have their, oh yes, we do. Here it is. Ha ha. Uh, new 1980s script read with producer director Richard Flank and actor Stacey Keach and Marion Edwards. Uh, we get uh, Brian May music demos. We get new interviews with Stacey Keach, new commentary by the cinematographer of its Vincent Monton, production coordinator Helen Watts, and costume designer Aphrodite Kondos, moderated by Mark Hartley of Not Quite Hollywood fame. Uh, I would say pick both of these up, personally. There is some stuff on the uh, Umbrella release that this release doesn't have, but at the same time, Shout Factory does uh, did pull out the stops of all this, so I would definitely say pick that up. This is a fantastic thriller. It's... Uh, it's de it's definitely a masterwork in uh in uh, in Australian genre cinema. So check it out in whatever version that you pick up. Okay, so next up <clears throat> in this, we also have uh, I'm going to do this in kind of a pair. You know, they don't share directors or anything like that, but the, they, they do share a theme, which is nature rebelling against man in some way. And so first up, of course, I want to talk about Long Weekend one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite films. And I like this film quite a lot. It's about a presumptuous yuppie couple that goes out for a vacation in the, in the, in the wilderness. Uh, and they're just fucking terrible. They're terrible people. They're awful. They're just pieces of shit, you know? And eventually, nature, you know, uh, fights back, you know, viciously. It's, it's really cathartic. It's really spooky, as a matter of fact. Um, animals fight back, you know. Uh, 
nature shoved itself up their asses, and that's the best description that I can think of. About now, Synapse is a is a great label. You know, I mean, it, we all saw their release of Suspiria a couple of years ago. I've I've got that myself, and that that one is stocked for days. This one is not quite as stocked, but uh, we've got audio commentaries and motion still galleries. We've got you know. Uh, that's that's pretty much about the size of it there, but this is fantastic, and I think this is probably the best release you can get of this right now, so I would definitely say pick it up. It's a fantastic thriller with, a, of course, amazing atmosphere inspired by the environment and the location of rural Australia, or, the you know, nature. Austra Australian nature. Um, now, also by Umbrella Entertainment, and this is, I, it hasn't gotten a Region 1 release or a Region A release yet, uh, one of my other favorite films, directed by, of Highlander fame, Russell Mulcahy, Razorback, about a wild boar. It's like, well, good description of it is Jaws on Trotters, which is what they, uh, it's actually the name of a documentary on the back of this here. Uh, this, on its face, has a real, real silly plot, but, you know, it's, it's, it's about a big, giant Four, ravaging uh, through the Australian countryside, killing people, just, you know, running amok, and the people who have to go out and try to stop it. But, sounds silly on its face, this film has some of the best cinematography, some of the most haunting shots, some of the most... It's... it's. I heard it described one way as Terrence Malick decided to make a, a horror film. It's very much like that. You, This film is a wash in colors, in exaggerated angles, in, uh, in just such... Such a, such a gunt punch of, of, of atmosphere, just fucking, you know, and they do it really well. Um, it's, it's also got like one of the most, uh, straight up eye popping moments when the wild boar takes out a whole house, I believe pretty early on, um, uh, there's not enough that I can say about how fantastic this film is, I mean, uh, the cinematography alone Every single shot could be framed and put up on a wall. I mean, it's it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. And this edition from Umbrella Entertainment, as uh, with the rest of their line, uh, is full of fantastic stuff. We've got audio interviews, audio commentaries. The director. We've got Jaws on Trotters, which is a documentary about the making of. We've got the original VHS cut, which is where a lot of us, like myself, saw it originally. Uh, we've got retrospectives. We've got deleted scenes with optional audio commentary. Uh, this is fantastic stuff, and of course, like most of their releases, it's region A, B, and C, so if you want to pick this up, it's not too expensive on Amazon, or if you ever go back inside a record store, they'll probably have it, I would say, uh, or our local Waterloo Records, they'll definitely have it. Um, this, this should be taught in film schools, definitely, it should be taught in film schools right now. Okay, so now the part of the video that I was, I'm actually pretty excited to talk about, which is Mad Max, of course, but we're not going to go too, too, too into it, because I still have another video that I'd like to talk about, it was George Miller in general, but we're going to talk about it in the context of Australian cinema, which does require going into it a teeny bit, so, um, and not just Mad Max, we're also going to be talking about uh, a few of the films that are kind of antecedent to it, uh, or related to it tangentially in some way. So, now of course, we all know, or at least those of us who are supremely interested, we all know the origin story of Mad Max. You know, you've got a, a physician who decides to be a filmmaker uh, with his friend Byron Kennedy, and they spend four years writing this script about a journalist, uh, a journalist who gets involved in contemporary gang fights between motorcycle gangs. Now, that wasn't going to work too much. They had to re rework the script. Uh, based around their budget, and uh, in that way, uh, it became uh, not quite post-apocalyptic, that first film, but it became uh, pushed forward into the future to allow for sort of a degradation, so cheaper locations and things like that, which uh, then completely changed the identity of the film. And so out of that, of course, we've got Mad Max. This is the best release so far of this film, by Shout Factory, of course, uh, I believe Warner Brothers owns the rights to the other films, so we're probably not going to see any boutique releases of them in the near future, although that's uh, that's, that's a shame, because, I mean, 
my opinion on this film on on this series of films uh is pretty well known uh this is a pretty stock edition you know uh it ports over a lot of the extras that you found in the old MGM special edition that came out I think in the early 2000s uh and two new documentaries I believe uh Mel Gibson the birth of a superstar and Mad Max the film phenomenon now in this film I mean this film is one of my biggest inspirations in terms of just how I want to make films which is of course very raw very guerrilla you know uh beg borrow steal as a guiding philosophy and accomplishing this film really demonstrates that you can accomplish you can accomplish the most and put forward uh i guess put forward a film filled with this is going to sound tautological but a film with real fullness in terms of feeling and emotion you know and texture all through technique this film's guiding philosophy which I think was actually happened upon in the editing room, uh, the year-long editing process, which is not a strange thing for George Miller, uh, in his kitchen, you know, looking at each piece of the film in tandem, without sound, uh, purely through technique, purely through editing style, this film's guiding philosophy is, uh, is silent film philosophy. You know, it's, it's, it's visual storytelling par excellence, and of course this film also was a revolution in action filmmaking. I mean, in filmmaking in general, but in action filmmaking. And it, the lessons that it uh, teaches were also furthered uh, in The Road Warrior, to a lesser extent in Beyond Thunderdome, but it other things on its mind. And then, of course, in Fury Road, which, as we, uh, which, as I've said before, I believe is the new textbook, the new masterclass on action filmmaking uh, and visual storytelling in general for this uh, new generation of filmmakers going forward. Now, what's funny though, is that directly after this film was made, and before uh, Mad Max 2 had even started shooting, I believe, uh, another filmmaker, based off the success of this film, his name's Ian Barry, uh, came up with uh, another uh, strange science fiction uh, self-contained tale. This is The Chain Reaction. Now, what's the relationship here? Well, the relationship here, of course, is... Twofold. Uh, the main star of this film is Steve Beisley, who of course plays the goose in Mad Max. He's charismatic, he's funny, he's a real larrikin. Uh, and we also get uh, we also get Mel Gibson in a cameo. We get Hugh Keysburn, another cameo. And what's really great is the two preeminent action sequences in this film. The two car chase sequences in this film uh, are directed entirely by George Miller, and they're a different kind of car chase sequence than you'll see in any kind of the Mad Max, because they're not car stunt sequences. They're just visceral, raw, low to the ground, self-contained, two cars on a tiny road car chases, and they're fantastic, right? This release is also put forward by Umbrella Entertainment, uh, and much like their other releases, A, B, and C. Um, we get documentaries, and of course, we get Not Quite Hollywood interviews and things like that. This is a fantastic film. Now, what I like about this film and also about the first Mad Max is that they're very pure narratives, right? Uh, they're not overly complicated. This is a husband and wife going out for a weekend in the country and getting embroiled in what's basically a pursuit, a chase, you know? And through that, uh, they they end up happening upon a conspiracy. There's, there's a, uh, you know, a uh, strange um there's a there's environmental context i don't want i don't want to give too much away is the reason why this all sounds kind of vague because it's really fantastic uh and the the portrayal of the secret government forces is rather fantastic as well this is a film that's kind of rich in atmosphere it's a lot 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 of fun and i think besides being fun it's also like I said, one of the most important things, it's a pure narrative. Now, it doesn't really have too, 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 too much on its mind. It does have quite a few things on its mind. But the most important thing is that it's a, such a well-constructed thriller uh, of, the, of the first order. And it's a well-constructed chase film in that way. Fantastic stuff. Check it out now. Uh, of course, we all know what happened next with George Miller, and that was the masterpiece of action cinema, the revolutionary masterpiece of action cinema, probably the best action film of the 80s and before, the Western on Wheels, the originator of the post-apocalyptic genre, that's The Road Warrior, and this is, of course, 
the preeminent release that you can get of it right now. This is even included in the High Octane Collection set. They put out all four films, but Fury Road. This is not too stocked. The films, The Road Warrior and Beyond Thunderdome, paradoxically, have not re received the same kind of releases as Mad Max, uh, the first one, uh, in terms of restoration or supplemental quality or things like that. I don't know why. Mad Max 2 is a much more well-respected film. It's a much more cohesive film. It is where the first Mad Max is the raw, visceral work of a first-time filmmaker. It's got, it's got a few pieces that have yet to fall into place. This film is straight up a masterpiece. And yet, this, this is an early Blu-ray release, and it hasn't really been changed much. This is a later imprint, but it hasn't really been changed much. This is, of course, from Warner Brothers. It's your standard. Uh, the only special features here are a commentary by George Miller and cinematographer Dean Simler. That's actually kind of rare. George Miller doesn't do special features, typically speaking, like that. Uh, and an introduction by Leonard Malton, which is always fun to listen to. He's such a dork. Um, I have an issue with this, which is why I actually have multiple copies of this film. It's not just because I'm a nerd, but because um, when Fury Road came out, um, people lauded the uh, explosion of color that was the way they portrayed uh, per portrayed the Australian desert or the Namibian desert standing in for Australia. You know, the reds, the deep reds, the big blooming blue sky. The thing about it was, that was the aim as well with the Road Warrior. And that's how it looks in theaters. If you see it on 35, which I have, or if you watch it on VHS, or even the older DVD imprint, they had the right color timing. They spent a long time in the lab pushing the reds of the desert and the dust and the blues of the sky as far as they could go, almost into surreal territory. But in this new release... Uh, it's been color corrected, I think not by the cinematographer and definitely not by George Miller. Everything has kind of a sickly green hue. It's a bit more subdued, understated, which is uh, fine on its own, but it's not representative of the original intention of the filmmakers. This, Besides that, of course, seeing it in high-def Blu-ray is uh, an amazing experience. This is one of the most, it's the most widescreen film, uh, I think. Uh, or the or the fastest widescreen film, I think. Uh, the construction... I mean, there's not much that I can say that hasn't been said about that film. Um, but just in terms of releases, I wanted to go ahead and mention that. Now, the same thing is also true, I think, of the next film in the series, which is uh, Beyond Thunderdome. This is... Uh, it's not underappreciated anymore. Uh, this is my... You know, I think this is a much better film than the first Mad Max. It's much more potent. It's much more myth mythological... Um, which we'll go into a little bit right now. Uh, previous to Mad Max 2 coming out, you know, uh, George Miller had no idea for what the second film was going to be, and then he went to L.A., and he met up with Terry Hayes, who had written the novelization for the first Mad Max. He spent a lot of time celebrating on what the second film could be, and he, uh, George Miller went to a talk, I believe, where he heard Joseph Campbell talk. Uh, he read Hero of a Thousand Faces, and it kind of opened him up to some of the unconscious things that were happening with the first Mad Max and the reason why it was so well received. Um, the, uh, the relationship between its iconography and the shared iconography of different countries, the samurai, the cowboy, the lone warrior, and, Vi you know, and Viking culture and things like that. And so he, with the second film, emphasized that. And he... That's the real relationship between Mad Max 2 and Fury Road, is the fact that it, it's, it's a... It's a reduced narrative in terms of plot, but it's a it's a very complex film in terms of mythological texture and um, and resonance, which is very much on purpose. You know, uh, the desert becomes well, the Australian desert in Mad Max Two becomes the desert. It becomes the dreamlike desert of the unconscious. You know, which is very much a purposeful thing. This film is figures in a landscape at 120 miles an hour. There's not enough can be said about that now. Knowing that unconsciously storytelling and that kind of metatextual stuff was running in the background of Mad Max 2, they take that forward and into higher depths with Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Now, of course, we all know what happened previous to the making of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, which is Byron Kennedy, who was George Miller's partner on the first two films, died tragically in a helicopter crash. I don't believe that changed the film too much, however, because uh, they, they had written the script, the script was finalized, and they were scouting locations as we speak. It's a lighter film, um, 
definitely in terms of tone, but I think that's good because what we see in the film is that the world is starting to heal. Um, it's not healing necessarily in the best way with the overly capitalistic barter town or the simplistic, uh, overly religious, we'll say, kids from the crack in the earth, but it's healing. It's becoming more complex. Civilizations returning is the point of the film. Uh, and what we see in the film is wonderful. I mean, Barter Town, you know, Roger Ebert said that he'd never, he'd, he'd rarely seen a cinematic construction like that, um, to paraphrase. It's just, it's a wonder work, and it's also the origin point of some images, some imagery, some, some further imagery that reoccurs throughout George Miller's other non-Mad Max work in the years to follow, which I'll get into in another video. Um, the cinematography, also by Dean Simler, takes on new mythic heights. There's a lot of references to Lawrence of Arabia uh, in, its, in its shots, in its composition. And I think it's, you know, the desert looks bigger. It looks broader. The, envir the environment plays a role in shaping the narrative as well, uh, which is the, this is the first time that happens in a George Miller film. Um, which it will happen in a lot of films to come, in particular the next film, uh, which is of Eastwick, that he's made. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful film. Um, it, like Mad Max 2, received the same kind of sickly green post-processing on its Blu-ray release, uh, which doesn't do it any favors. It actually, this film includes one of my favorite opening shots of a film from way up high, as uh, Jedediah, played again by Bruce Spence in sort of a weird Sergio Leone, you know, casting the same guy in two different parts, which again will reoccur as a device in George Miller's films, arcs way down with his biplane from way up high and swoops down to right on top of Max's camel uh, wagon. It's an amazing shot. Uh, we get Tina Turner uh, playing sort of like the archetypal, or the archetypal, <laughs> tyrant character uh she is she's meant to be at the very least as a character someone who is basically what max would be if he'd stayed with the kids in the crack in the earth um it's all cyclical cyclical you know it's a cycle <laughs> um the imagery in this film is astounding the stunt work in this film the the action sequences and their and their composition their editing i believe in certain places uh either matches or even goes further in experimentation than Mad Max the Road Warrior in certain points, but I think a lot of people miss that because it's not as overly violent. You know, most people in this film aren't even trying to kill each other because this is civilization. People aren't as barbaric as they are in Mad Max 2. That's kind of the point, you know? There's, there's a lot more comedy. There's a lot more... Uh, it's very silent film slapstick comedy, which is great, you know? Uh, I love I love that, you know? Um these three films, well, Mad Max 1 is fine, but Mad Max 2 and Thunderdome, they need a crucial restoration by Arrow or even Shout Factory or, you know, Criterion, which I've, I've labored upon for years, but I don't, you know, I don't know if that's ever going to happen because of the rights. I mean, I'm sure they'd love to, but... Um, so, that's the original three, and then, of course, 20 years later... Uh, or, well, 30 years later, really, from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, we've got the, the new masterpiece of action filmmaking, Mad Max Fury Road. Now, I'm going to not go into this as much as possible because I want to save all that material for a video that I will be producing later on. It's going to take more work than just me pointing my phone at my face. Um, this is the Black and Chrome edition. I actually also have the other edition as well. Uh, I've got two copies of this. One of those things where you want to buy multiple copies of the thing you love. Maybe it's just me because I'm obsessive. Um, I've not actually watched the Black and Chrome version in full yet. I've watched it in bits and pieces over the time being. I've seen the original uh, untold number of times in theaters. I saw it five times in theaters. I've studied it. You know, I've torn it apart, put it back together again, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a masterwork. Bar none. Can't say enough about it. Well, no, you really can't say enough about it. But I'm going to save that for later on. I just want to talk about the release of it in general. The release is kind of bare bones, and everybody thought there would be like a two-disc or a special edition coming out later on. Uh, as a matter of fact, people thought the black and chrome version would be initially featured as a special feature on the Blu-ray release of the film, but it wasn't. 
took a full year and a half, I think, afterwards. Um, there's not there's not too much on here. Just small kind of EPK feature adds some things. I mean, the Blu-ray restoration itself is amazing to watch. Uh, I haven't seen it in 4K yet. I'm actually reticent to do that because I know from, you know, the upscaling process from one format to another is usually kind of tricky with films that are stunt heavy or, you know, have a lot of digital replacement of certain elements. Not a lot of CGI in this film, of course, I mean, but there is a lot of digital replacement of skies and things like that, which uh, is seamless in Blu-ray and DVD and in theaters, but who knows what they've done in 4K. I've heard some bad things. Um, my great hope is that this does, like the original three films, get released by Criterion or Arrow or someone like that at some point. It's it's well deserving. It's a, this this film is a textbook of modern filmmaking, of visual storytelling, of pure cinema. I can't say it enough. Um, but what I can say, because I just won't shut up. Um, is I want to talk about a film that came out in I believe yeah. The year before Fury Road, what a contrast, a film that is basically, even though the filmmaker himself, Guy Michaud, question mark, um, or sorry, David Michaud, uh, was it? I'm not sure why I was thinking Guy, I know, I know his name, but i um, not sure that's how you pronounce it though, I apologize, but uh, even though he, he uh, refutes this, or he tries to anyway, uh, this is basically a spiritual sequel to the first Mad Max, following a day in the life of a regular Joe guy who goes fucking off the reservation and uh, goes to get his car back. He runs into Robert Pattinson, uh, fresh off the Twilight films, I believe, giving a actor balls off performance in this. Um, this is a fantastic, gritty, brutal, relentless film, and this is, this is exploitation cinema, modern exploitation cinema, definitely. Uh, it's wonderful to see it, and it shares so much DNA with the first Mad Max film that it's ridiculous. Um, with, I think, more modern filmmaking techniques in mind. Um, Guy Pearce is fantastic. Uh, he's got kind of a Walter White thing happening in the film, where his, where his outfit is kind of, you know, schlubby, schmucky, <laughs> which is really funny, but he doesn't conduct himself in that way, and it's clear by the time this film picks up, the world has fallen down majorly. Um, this is, this is pretty, it's, it's an, it's an A24 release, and this, this, uh, release only has one special feature, it's a making of, I wish this film got more attention, I really do, because it's really, really, really great. Um, now, that's, that's the children of Mad Max, the, the, I mean, and also Dead End Driving, which we just talked about earlier, uh, but also, too, I want to go ahead and talk about, uh, there's not too much literature on its own dedicated to the Mad Max series, which I think is a shame because I think they're probably some of the more important films of the last 40 years, definitely. Uh, they are the clearest equivalent, I think, to Sergio Leone's series of westerns uh, in terms of innovation, technique, viscera, uh, all that. But there are two. One is recent, one is a little bit older. Uh, Adrian Martins, who is a fantastic film critic, uh, who's from Australia, wrote this uh, for Australian string classics, the Mad Max movies. Goes over the first three. Uh, th this is fantastic. It's hard to find. So if you can find it, pick up a copy. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. And then, of course, we have by Luke Buckminster. Uh, Miller and Max. Which, this also goes into Australian exploitation cinema's history a little bit and the context surrounding the arrival of the first Mad Max as well. It's brilliant. It's you know, it's brilliant read. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, in terms of prose style, it's you know, not the not the uh, most in depth coverage in the world. I mean, there are things that I know about the production of Fury Road that I don't think this guy knows. Um, in terms of what happened on set, but if you're interested, uh, and if you're interested in some behind the scenes stuff that you might not know about the Road Warrior or Thunderdome or what goes into that, because a lot of it's dedicated not to George Miller or the films themselves, it's dedicated to kind of like the on-set drama of the three films. Um, I would definitely say pick that up. Uh, he does go into definitely the mythological framework of the film and the writing and the effort process that kind of came into 
keeping that on a subconscious Jungian level in the film, which is, was a big thing um, that George Miller and Byron Kennedy and Terry Hayes did. Uh, they were inspired by Star Wars, definitely. There is a definite relationship there, but I think they, which he kind of points out a little bit in the book, they went in a different direction to keep it more subconscious, to keep the, uh, the stages of the Campbellian cycle uh, more poetic and less concrete, which was George Lucas's technique. Uh, so definitely pick those up if you'd like to have a read. And now the last thing that I want to talk about, because my battery is running low on this phone, is the great documentary, Not Quite Hollywood, by Mark Hartley, which of course you've heard that name come up many times, talking about Umbrella Entertainment's releases. Uh, this is so funny. This is one of my favorite films in the entire world. <laughs> it's got interviews with everybody. Quentin Tarantino's in there, because of course he is, you know. Uh, this has interviews with George Miller, Brian Trenchard Smith, Richard Franklin, Stacey Keach, Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, this, if, if you want a good introduction to Ozploitation cinema, check this film out. Uh, it's got a Blu-ray release by Umbrella Entertainment, of course, but I just had the DVD because it's what I picked up uh, a while back. Now, uh, that's all I have to say about that. This film is f it's so funny. It's so much fun. It's so cool. I just you, you gotta, gotta check it out. Um, now. Let it be said that all the films that I've talked about today and all the things that I've talked about today, uh, this is just a drop in the bucket of exploitation cinema. You know, there's, there's more that's been released since uh, recently. And there are other films from the heyday, the 70s, the 60s, and the 80s uh, that I didn't get to talk about, like, uh, like Patrick. Um, or The Howling Three, The Marsupials, which I, I haven't seen. Don't want to see it. And for those who have, you know why. Um, and a billion others like that. I mean, uh, it's it's a widespread genre, and it's just full of such pure technique. Pure, raw, unfiltered, untested technique by a bunch of filmmakers who knew their country in the context of cinema had something to prove. And no disrespect, of course, to the historical dramas that came out uh, that were state-funded by Peter Weir and people like that, because, you know, the, a lot of them are masterpieces. Penny the Hanging Rock is one of the greatest films as well. But these films, I think, are more representative of, of uh, just in terms of pure richness and experimentation and, uh, you know, all that fun stuff that makes filmmaking what it is. These are more representative of the Australian film industry than, than those. Those are the pretty face they were putting on. These are the films that I think they really wanted to make, you know, Genre exercises, experimentation, formality. They 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 were really big on formalism back in the '60s and the '70s and the '80s. There, you know, um, George Miller, of course, is a student disciple of Eisenstein, um, and Buster Keaton, <laughs> uh, and the same goes for Richard Franklin, who, of course, is a student of Hitchcock. Uh, the DNA is so clear in all these films of where they're coming from, uh, and I think also too, Brian Trichard Smith. You know, I'm, I don't, you know, want to speak for the guy because he does have a constant online presence on YouTube, definitely, but I do believe that he probably worshipped a little bit at the business acumen and the style and the rawness of Roger Corman, I mean, or NAIP as well, who actually released a lot of his films in America. Uh, so, yeah. Um, this is kind of a brief overview of my favorites. Uh, not too in-depth. I like to say the in-depth stuff for what are going to be video essays. I keep saying that and they'll, they'll be around eventually and you'll get to hear more fuller uh, critical analyses of certain things. I, I, you know, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you check these films out. Uh, that's all I've got. Uh, have, a, have a lovely, lovely day.